they wanted a few more minutes. Well, good afternoon. Welcome. We are in the midway point of this fall's Dole Institute Fellowship Conversations about women, democracy, and global politics. I'm Nancy Bosker, and it is a delight to have you here. I see familiar faces, Francisco, Orlando, and Mary. Thank you very much. You're going to get a medal for attending every week. It's like you're the perfect attendance people. Uh, when I am not here on Wednesdays at the Dole Institute, I am the director for the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy at Texas Women's University. Very grateful that they let me play hooky once, uh, once a week to fly up here from Dallas, Texas. Before, we, before I introduce my guest, I would like to talk to you about next week's guest. Next week, another pal of mine, Deb Sofield, will be coming out from Greenville, South Carolina, and she is an executive speech coach. Now, she teaches people, as she would say, how to give an amazing presentation. She is a speech coach to Fortune 100 execs. She also does coaching for students who are trying to get into law school and med school and are up for big interviews. She's actually coached a couple of my uh, mentees to help them be prepared for their interviews. But she also runs another business called To Coach a Queen. Yes, my friend Deb actually coaches beauty queens. Because she does not care what you wear or how that bathing suit fits, she wants to make sure that when someone asks you about the difference between North and South America that you know, uh, but also she teaches these young women beyond current events, just how to give a great presentation. And when she's often questioned by some of our more feminist friends going, how could you do this? And she always goes, you know what, if I can take a young woman that is growing up in a trailer park somewhere in South Carolina or Georgia or Mississippi or elsewhere, and I can teach her so she can win a pageant, she has put more young women into colleges because once you are like Miss Sweet Corn Queen and the Rodeo Champ and all of this, all these queens, these young women can put, them, put themselves through, um, through college in all four years with no student loan debt. And that's really the powerful message she brings to those that go, ooh, you're doing beauty pageants. Um, I first met Deb when she was a student at the Women's Campaign School at Yale and I was um, a board member at the time. She then joined the board and ended up being the president. And we accept, at the Women's Campaign School at Yale, we accept uh, 75 women from around the world every summer and teach them during a week-long campaign school how to be the best candidate, campaign worker, or really what does public leadership look like. So Deb has just done yeoman's duty really helping women in countries like Afghanistan, across North Africa, across Africa, around the world, teaching women how to find their voices in countries where women really have never had a voice. Um, so Deb will be here next week. She has visited with me or has come with me to Russia on two occasions. We've taught in various other places, but she has also traveled around the world teaching women how to give us presentation and as she would say, an amazing speech. So thank you again for being here. I'd like to introduce this week's guest, Lee Peterson. Uh, we sometimes call him doctor uh, because Lee Peterson has a compelling story. He grew up in Cleveland, outside of Cleveland, ended up going to Bethany College in West Virginia, but then ended up at the London School of Economics where he did get his PhD about the crumbling, something about Russia, which we'll ask him. I always forget what his 
thesis is on, because when you Google Lee Peterson, you can't really find anything about him. Um, my interns and former housemates used to say that Lee was the housemate or the house guest most likely to be in the CIA, um, but he has never been able to confirm nor deny that. But let's just say he has, one of the few people I know who has no social media footprint. But we'll ask him a little bit about that. But today I wanted to visit with him uh, about, he has worked in more than 40 countries and he has worked in hot spots like Iraq, Zimbabwe, to help people, pro-democracy people, get elected, or at least how to run a campaign. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the controversies that we hear about with Paul Manafort and all these people that are making millions of dollars from uh, the other, let's just say he works for people that we don't work with. We're just, ha we're just happy if someone sends us a plane ticket most of the time. <laughs> but Lee, tell us a little bit, um, and then we'll talk about your career. Tell us how you got this interest that all of a sudden you're heading to Bethany, and then the next thing you know, you're an um, expert on British politics yeah. and ends up living in Russia. Right. Well, thanks, Nance, and thanks Absolutely. for being inviting me to be here. Um, the, the problem with this event, and I mentioned this to Nancy earlier, I said, I don't know if this is going to be a Q&A or someone that I've known for 20 years doing deep psych, uh, <laughs> psychopathic uh, <laughs> research on me or something like that. Um, Nancy mentioned my... Uh, my distaste for social media, uh, just quickly to address that. I've worked in campaigns where every person in that campaign working with me has had their full CV, their full social media history on the front page of the local newspaper, and all they have on me is my name. And I like that, and I want it that way, because working in campaigns in some hot spots, it's never, never a good thing to have too much of a background on you. So it's, it's always been my, my attempt to uh, stay as low profile as I can. Um, the, the story that, about my, how I got into this, it was kind of funny. I started my, my freshman year of college at Bethany College, and actually one of my classmates is in the back of the room here. Um, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was just going to be your normal kid from Ohio who was going to get a college degree, get a job, get married, whatever. And I happened to have, there was a, a strange class at the school. It was on Nazism. And it was a required, one of the required courses one had to take. There was a selection. Politics in the Middle East, Nazism, and I think Appalachian Studies. And I decided I was going to do the Nazism. And it opened a world to me of the politics and how, how politics intermingles with every aspect of your life. And I think the Nazi experience was one that really attracted me because everything had to fit. The role of the church had to fit. The role of society had to fit. Everything was forced into this. And I loved it. I, I became immediately a political science major and followed, uh, followed that path. I did a, a semester in the UK, and while I was there, I met a member of parliament who said, why don't you come back in the following summer and, and, uh, and do, be an intern for me? So I, I did that. And uh, while I was there, I read... F.A. Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. Well, I don't know if any of you have ever read The Road to Serfdom, and if you haven't, I'm chastising you right now. It's one of the greatest pieces of political philosophy out there. Um, it says in the very beginning of it, F.A. Hayek wrote this while a professor of economics at the London School of Economics. Well, I also knew the name of the London School of Economics is actually the London School of Economics and Political Science. No one ever says that, but so I thought, this is my place. I found my people. <laughs> libertarians and people like that. Well, the problem was when I finally got to the LSE, I realized Hayek had shipped off to the University of Chicago and all his people had gone and only the left was left at, at, at the LSE. So I was a very small minority of individuals who thought of the libertarian kind of center-right, Thatcher politics, Thatcher economics of the time. So I, I learned my politics there at the LSE because it's a very very politically uh, energized place, and, uh, and I loved every minute I was there. I spent a really long time there. I did a master's and a PhD, and, and um, I just fell in love with that whole environment and the political side of that environment. Continued to work with the conservative party while I was there. I was, ended up working as John Major's advance man through two election cycles. Um, and then when that ended, I had to go find work, and 
that kind of ended my academic. I finished my PhD. Uh, major got ousted out of office, and I needed to go find a job. So tell us about your thesis. I know it has something to do with the crumbling of Russia, but... Right. Well, I had the great ignominy. I started on my thesis uh, the autumn of, of, of 1988. And I don't know if there's anybody who does physics around here, but you might understand this, this comparison. Um, in 1988 was the beginning of Gorbachev and, and the impact of Gorbachev on the world and, and the Cold War. And I was doing a Cold War thesis. I was looking at certain aspects of the Cold War. Well, there was a, we had a seminar, a weekly seminar at the LSE where we'd come in and someone would talk about a chapter of their thesis. And this was the security people and all the security environment of the Cold War. And week after week, someone would come in and said, well, I was going to talk about this thesis, but because of Gorb Gorbachev's announcements this morning, it's worthless. I can't do anything. So I had a, a period where I went out into the wilderness and worked as a researcher at various institutes. I worked at the Mershon Center at Ohio State for a year. I worked at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs for a couple of years and then came back with an idea of exactly what the Cold, how the Cold War collapsed and what it was that forced the United States and the Soviet Union finally to call a truce to the Cold War. So that was my basic thesis. Um, and as a result of that um, and the collapse of the Cold War, it drove me not to want to go into the academic route, but I wanted to go f kind of figure out what the hit me and hit the rest of the world that caused this event. So an opportunity arose for me to go to Russia and work in Russia with the IRI. And uh, it started my career working internationally in international politics. So that's where our paths first, first crossed. Yes. And just for some background, when Ronald Reagan was president, he said, we have the Peace Corps to teach people how to grow things. We need organizations to teach people how to grow democracy. And so that was the, uh, really the beginning of the National Endowment for Democracy. And there are four programs under, under NED, as we call it. Um, IRI, International Republican Institute, which was uh, chaired by Senator John McCain for very, for his, until he passed away. Um, as I like to say, he may be a, you know, an SOB, but he's my SOB and he loves democracies. Um, but I too have worked very much, very closely with IRI. There's NDI, National Democratic Institute. We do the same things, just a little bit of a shade different. Uh, we split up work in a lot of countries. I've done work for both. Um, Madeleine Albright is very involved with NDI. And those of you who met Susan Markham, she had worked at NDI, and that's when we first met. Uh, there's an organization called CIPE, C-I-P-E, and it's the Center for um, Individual Private Enterprise. And it's kind of, it works with the chamber, but it teaches business principles, business ethics, and helps businesses grow. And then there's the um, labor organization that has recently changed their name, and I never can remember what the, uh, the fourth the fourth wing. Um, well, Solidarity Center. Solidarity right. Center, thank right. you, um, which works with labor unions. And so um, when we do things for NED, for the National Endowment for Democracies, and with these different institutes, it's open to all. Um, Bill Lacey was talking about they weren't allowed to teach communists, but I remember working in the Republic of Georgia, and if a communist wanted to come, we could not turn anyone away. So we don't want you to ever think we're influencing individual politics in the countries we work with all parties, as, as Lee certainly did. So just a little bit of a background on how all this came about under, under President Reagan. Right. So um, when you went to Russia, um, were you in Moscow or St. Petersburg at the time? I was in Moscow. Okay. IRI had contracted to just one office, and they were in Moscow at the time. And when all of us were there in that early time, I remember being an um, election observer in Rostov-on-Don in 1995, and there were almost 160 parties on the, on the ballot. There was a beer drinker party, but the ballot was like a world map. I mean, it was giant because they weren't, no one trusted anyone, which is still the problem we deal with, uh, but everyone, they didn't want to compromise anything. They went, we finally have a voice having not had one mm -hmm. for nearly 100 years. And so everyone had their own political party, which really became quite 
it was just fractured. Right. So tell me how, how was it to try to work with men, but also some of the early work we did with women's leadership sure. in Russia? Mm -hmm. Well, um, one of the, first of all, Nancy's point on us working in, in Russian democracy. When Putin describes the meddlers who came into Russia and meddled in their democracy, there are two of them right here. We wear that mantle proudly. Yes, we, we, we both wear that mantle proudly. Um, uh, the, the, the programming that we worked with at IRI had kind of several levels, levels with, with women. Um, we, we ran a few programs. One was the, my predecessors, um, people Nancy knows really well, started the League of Women Voters of St. Petersburg, which was, again, the, to play that role, that, that kind of administrative role outside the electoral process that is not done by the state, but by the local community to to build that avenue into politics, to get people to take up that mantle of, of the responsibility of politics. And while I was there, it had been already established, but we were taking them across the country to try to build leagues in other cities. We did actually do one in Rostov. Uh, we did them in various cities in, the, in, the, uh, in Siberia and places like that to try to build this again. You know, democracy is not just election time. It, it, it runs throughout the, the, the course of, of a society through every day, every month. Things need to happen and trying to build that into a, a society is, is quite difficult. We also, with women, we, we worked um, with women legislators. In, in, in Russia, you have kind of a three-tier uh, um, political structure similar to here in the United States where you have your local mayors, City, city halls, um, city councils, and then you have, uh, they call them oblast level, where we have state level, and then they had the federal level. And uh, it was really difficult to work with the federal level, but we worked quite a bit with the state level. Again, because as we know, federal level employees and, and federal level elected officials come from the lower levels, and we were trying to, to build that in that level. That so, farm team. Yes, exactly. So you could pick, your parties could pick who were the best people to get elected and trying to build that through the, uh, the women's parliamentarian program. So. I remember when I was there that uh, one of the most prominent and first of the women's groups were the mothers of soldiers. Yes. Because uh, it's, it's conscription, it's, still, it's yeah. age 17. Yes. That, uh, we take your sons away, and you, they were disappearing into Afghanistan, and of course, Chechnya, and you never heard from them again, and the treatment was horrendous, and it was those mothers, as usual, it was women stepping up to say, where are our sons, and mm -hmm. trying to have some accountability right. uh, with the Russian government, and, and that was really, if, beyond the, the League of Women Voters, I just right. remember that was a very prominent group that we were working with. It was. The, the problem with many of these groups, though, is they, they don't want affiliation, and we understandably, they don't want affiliation with a political party, which we understand, but to try to get them to understand, too, that their job is to lobby not only the, the, the president and, and the Kremlin, as the, the, the general presidential administration is described, but to work with, with the Duma, the parliament, to get laws enacted to protect the kids and things like that. And that's a role they, they were afraid of. They didn't want to step across that political line and trying to advise them on that was one of the most difficult things we, we, we had to do. And it's, it's a sad case, but it, it's kind of indicative of the work you do that these organizations that existed even prior to the democracy didn't make that transition very well. No, and, and you know, I've always contended you have to have trust and transparency. Right. And I add my third T of tithing. People have to have a history of giving back. And those are three items that are just void yeah. in any place I've ever worked in, especially in the former Soviet republics and, of course, in Russia, yeah. because no one trusts anyone. You could get turned in to the KGB just so you could have a better apartment or a better job or not have your heat turned off in the, in the winter. And mm -hmm. the draconian... Uh, life. Uh, yeah. No one trusted anyone, and, mm -hmm. and we'll talk more about Africa on that too, but, but I just remember both of us talking about it. Just imagine what a horrible way to live when you trust no one, and transparency is all about the corruption. Everything is under the table. Yeah. 
you, you have to, there's a, a great Russian expression called the krisha, which is the roof, and to exist in Russia, you, you have to work with, um, uh, this roof protects you, and you, you have links that, you, if, if I'm working and trying to work with an individual within Russia, in, within the Russian government, I could not ring them up, you know, call them and say, hey, I'm here, I would like to work with you, and I, I do programming or whatever. I would never get through to that individual. I would have to go through the, the krisha of a contact until someone that I knew that they knew would introduce us. That's the only way to work because there's no trust within the shaking of a hand or my, my job is, is, is my bond, that I work for this organization and I will do as I say. That, that sort of trust and, and, and linkage with communities doesn't exist. And it's something very hard to overcome when you're working in a society. So when you were working in Russia, um, when we talk about the trust, I always think of Yablica and mm -hmm. the other conservative, or the pro-democracy party. The Union of Right-Wing Forces. Yes, yeah. the, the two of them, even though they had the same overall vision, the, the leaders hated each other and it was such a competition that you were unable to win an election because you were, your, your votes were close split. Yeah. And, and now, it's, I think Yavlika still exists, but yeah. it's a shadow of its, its sure. former self, especially yeah. since Putin has, has cracked down on any form of dissent. Right, and they, they, they've killed off all the funding. I mean, that's what sent um, Hordakovsky into jail. I don't know if you may have Hordakovsky, who was the richest man in Russia ended up in jail mainly because he was funding the political opposition. That's what instigated the, the, the investigation into his, his, his past business dealings and led him to go into jail, was the fact that he was, he was funding the opposition political parties. So that, you know, dissent is, is completely kind of bottled up in, in, in Russia and, and only held in certain areas. Um, a, a point kind of to what you, we've been talking about, there's a, I, I have worked in South Africa, and there, there was a woman who was one of the original kind of anti-apartheid fighters. Her name is Mfela Mfela. I'll never forget the name. Um, and she was on the BBC show Hard Talk and talking about exactly this transition that societies go through. And she was asked, you know, what, what was the one thing you were surprised to learn or this whole process has taught you? She said, I never realized how difficult it was to make people realize that the transition from being a subject to a citizen is, is a chasm. It's so far that people don't grasp that, that you are no longer the subject, you are the master, you are the citizen. It is your vote that determines, and these people serve you, you don't serve them. And that, to me, you know, sums up the work we do all the time, that, the, that, that transition to understanding that now that you have the vote, you don't just give it to these people. You demand that they, they uphold what you say, that you are now the master, you are the citizen. And I, I think this is key to the democratization problem that we fight, that to try to get people to grasp their control of the society is in their hands, and they, they must demand it. And, and they don't. They, it is um, you know, people who make all the rules. There are all the rule followers, because it's easier to follow rules than it is to have free thought, because mm. free thought is messy. Now, it goes back to my favorite saying, change is difficult to not change is fatal. But changing is so incredibly diff difficult because mm -hmm. they've always had other people make decisions, and all of a sudden there's free will, and, and they don't know what to do. Right. And, and you would think this would be, wow, you can go vote, you can be in control of your life, and it's petrifying to them. Right, yeah, it is, and it's, it's, it's difficult to build that um, that kind of the spirit of, a, of an electorate, that we've elected you and now it's four years on or five years on and you have not fulfilled what you promised us. We're gonna go punish you. you. We've had it. We've had our time with you and it is time to change. And that's not a, a, a normal transition in many of these societies and a lot of the governments won't even allow it because they'll fix the numbers and, 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 and cheat on the elections. I mean, this is not only in, in Russia or in, in you know, many of the other places in Africa and the Middle East I've worked. I mean, the classic is, is Putin's first presidential election. He was so 
keen to get over 50%. He wanted more than 50%. And we were looking at the, the total, uh, the, the tabulations of the numbers, and all of a sudden, within the last two hours of, of, of the election results, two million votes came in that were never accounted for. They, we never knew where they were. That gave him 54%. He didn't want 50% plus one. He wanted 54%. And that was a number that was decided on, and two million votes just all of a sudden appeared. You know, we've certainly seen the, the I don't want to say the end of democracy, but we've certainly seen Putin do everything he can to kill it. Mm -hmm. uh, when we meet with, and uh, Natalia Arna is going to be a guest in a couple of weeks, and she founded the Free Russia Foundation. And one of the things that, when we talk to people in Russia, it's so fatalistic. You know, what is the plan for the future? And the answer is always, Putin can't live forever. Right. Yeah. And that is the only, that is their plan. And because they're scared. And mm -hmm. as we have talked in, in previous, uh, my friend, Miss um, uh, Nastia is her, is her nickname. Anastasia. Anastasia, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's her birthday today, and she has been in jail since January, and while she has been jailed for holding up a sign in Rostov on Don that said, fight corruption, there's never been a trial set, it keeps getting delayed, um, her 17-year-old special needs daughter died because there was no one to care for her, the child, and two other children are out there, and the day is her birthday, and it's been all over my Facebook pages that she is celebrating her birthday, and I worked with her in Berlin, and we became very good friends, and she always knew is the Russians are always fatalistic, right? Very. There's, there's no, you would never use the word, I'm an optimistic Russian. To, you know, and as my mother once said, when we went to Russia our first time in 1988, uh, and I'm like, Mom, no one smiles. Everybody's just, you know, it's just horrible. And she says, well, Nancy, Stalin was only 30 years ago. So there's mm -hmm. that whole, um, it, it is just, uh, it's so hard to overcome that because they have no hope most of the time. No, they don't. But, I, you know, I, I know it, it sounds horrible to say Putin can't live forever, but I, I, I agree in the sense that democracy does take time. I, I remember sitting in, in Moscow with a former um, British member of parliament, Michael Heseltine, kind of famous in, during the Thatcher era, and we were sitting at a conference, and he turned to me and he said, you know, we often forget my constituency in Britain has been sending a member of parliament to Westminster for 700 years. These guys have been doing it since 1989 or 1992. Mm -hmm. it, it's not something that happens overnight mm -hmm. and only by continuing to have elections and it will eventually turn. I, I, I'm a great believer. We're, we're in a period, and I think probably since Putin and this is worldwide, this just isn't in Russia, where democracy is on a slide. It's, it's sliding down. And even in the West, look at what's happening in various places. Look what's happening in Britain. The British electorate has decided they want to leave, and their, their officials will not allow it to happen. That, to me, is just a, an abandonment of democracy. But the point being is, is we continue to have elections, and we, it will eventually change. I do believe that. And I believe in the modern world, especially this information age we live in, you can't give people the choice of the toothpaste they use, the car they drive, and not who governs them. I don't think that works over time. It will eventually have to change. The difficulty, you know, don't make the prediction, but it will happen. Well, we've certainly seen tens of thousands of Russians protesting mm -hmm. and many jailed. Um, but even with Putin's clamping down on, on elections, there were record numbers of pro-democracy yeah. uh, people elected in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. And the candidates were in jail. But people still had sure. the courage to yeah. vote for change. Yeah. And so I think that was a, a real glimmer of hope that, that's coming. Right. I, I, my problem always with Russia is, is this, is that the, the, the democratic forces are in the, in the major metropolises. They're in St. Petersburg, they're in Moscow, but you go outside, you go into Siberia, you go into the, the Black Soil region, and you don't have that. Life is better there than it has been for you know, 500 years, because there has been some effect of change. You know, there, there isn't famine, there isn't, 
We used to go to the sanatoria that are spread across Russia, and each organization had one. The, the Pipe Fitters Union had one, the KGB had one, and they were looking for what to do with them now that these organizations no longer send their people to, to the sanatoria when they're, when they're ill or, or needing a rest. And what always remind, you know, struck me was when you got there, the food was horrible, but the thing was it was stodgy. It was about putting weight on you. That was the only purpose of the sanatorium, was to get you fat so you could send you back because starvation was a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, starvation isn't a problem in Russia now. No. You know, so we're moving. We're, we're, and I'm, when I say starvation is a problem, it was 100 years ago. It was maybe 50 years ago under Stalin it, or 70 years ago under Stalin. It, things don't happen overnight, but I'm, you know, I, I can't think but get disappointed when I see where Russia is now 20 years after I started working there. Yeah, well, it's always, you know, it's, it's a journey, not a sprint. Exactly. It is a long period, and they will be the first to tell you, well, you whippersnappers in America, yeah. we've been here for, uh, yeah. what, close to a 1,000 years? Yeah. More than a 1,000 years. We will endure. You yeah. people have only been around for, yeah. you know, since 1776, so to speak. Right, and of course, we always hear, Nancy, you don't understand politics here and yes. country X. I've, I've had it, and we were talking about this earlier. I, at one point, I had counted the number of languages. Someone had said that to me, and, and I was up to something like 35, where people said, Lee, you just don't understand. Politics and country X are different. You, no. you, you can't. You can spend 40 years, Lee, here, and you'll never understand politics here. But, but we understand it in about five minutes, right? Yeah, because it's politics. <laughs> that doesn't change. The context is what we need to understand, but the politics of it is still the same. So you leave the Soviet Union, or Russia, and uh, where did you go next? How did you start working in some other places? And well, I, I, went, I went back to London, and, and uh, a, a colleague of mine had started his own organization and own company, and I started working for them. And I began doing um, kind of spot starts and being brought into uh, different countries through USAID, Westminster Foundation for Democracy, IRI would bring me in, to work in various countries on short-term contracts. Just quite often when there was an election coming or there was a training need or something like that. So I uh, initially started off in Eastern Europe, so I did several, several uh, countries there. Um, followed on, did quite a bit in Africa, and then Middle East and a bit of Asia. So. I, I always looked at it as I, I kind of, while in Russia, I kind of built this tool belt of how democratization works and how you, you get people heading in the right direction. And I was convinced of it in Russia, but I wasn't sure, does this work everywhere else? Is everywhere else like this? Is, the, is politics so different in Russia that it, this won't translate to Zimbabwe or, or uh, Kenya or, or Iraq? So, tell us how you ended up in Iraq and what that was like. Um, because were you you were in a green zone and no, I wasn't. Oh, okay. So yeah, well, at a certain point in time, I stopped doing the USAID um, Westminster funding kind of work and started actually doing campaigns in these countries. And uh, I got brought in to work on the 2010 Iraqi parliamentary campaign and. Uh, there was only nine secular parties. There were the religious parties, and then there were nine secular parties. And my party headquarters that I worked for was in the house of the head of the party, who was a, who was a Iraqi mullah who had left Saddam's Iraq and gone to Iran and studied there and come back. But he was a secularist. He, he felt, you know, we, we won't get anywhere if... Um, having experienced uh, Islamic law and Islamic democratization in Iran, knew that he needed a secular society. So he was bringing Westerners in to help run his campaign. So we were in his headquarters, which was in the red zone. So every, every time we had a move, and I've, I've got this great picture of a colleague of mine and myself going to the bank, and it's 16 of us, all in body armor and everybody's carrying M16s and, and all sorts of armor and we had armored cars with us and we went to the bank to draw out $400. 
So it, it was that kind of situation. But our, our, our objective there was to make sure that, you know, we kind of spread the, the, the um, kind of at least give a voice for a, a, a different kind of electoral process, that it wasn't going to be just tribal religious uh, links and, 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 uh, and prove that there, there is a, a chance for a different type of, of politics. We had the, I, I don't know if you know the, the, the Democrat campaign manager, Joe Trippi, he was with us on that, and he did a, an a incredible campaign on television with, the, with our candidate, and it went across the country. The thing was is the two main parties, the, um, the Shiite party and the main Sunni party, stole all the votes, and we actually, in some villages where we knew the whole family was part of this group, we didn't get any votes in those, those villages. So, but you know, it's one of those cases where you just got to continue to fight the fight. And as we're seeing right now in Iraq, the, the youth are back out on the streets. Um, I don't think the, I've been someone that's believed the Arab Spring's not quite dead yet. It's just that events have caused it to be churned up and kind of go lay dormant for a while, but it'll be back. So and I think we're seeing some of that in Egypt too, which yeah. um, certainly tried. Um, I was there three times since Mubarak was overthrown, and, and then now we have uh, worse than it ever was under mm -hmm. Mubarak because um, Morsi, no, yeah. Morsi, is, uh, there's, is that the current? No. No, sorry, we threw him. I, it's hard to keep up yeah. in Egypt, yeah. uh, but the current president yeah. um, understands how to clamp down on social media, and Mubarak did not understand that. No. But it, again, and a, a bigger part of that, mm -hmm. um, and is why, you know, we, for several years, many of us at IRI are working with IRI and in that, we're, we're, we're pointing the US government that something's coming, we're expecting this. And the reason we are is, is that the Middle East has this huge youth bubble. Think back to the 1960s in the West when we had the, the baby boom that came out of the Second World War. A similar thing happened in the 80s in, in the Middle East. And so at the time of the Arab Spring, um, let me remember the numbers, uh, Tunisia, the mean age was 30. Mm -hmm. um, Egypt, the mean age was 25. Uh, Libya was, I think, 22. Uh, Syria and Iraq were a bit younger. So you have this huge youth bubble coming through. And we know with youth bubbles, what they mean is you have a whole generation that no longer listens to their parents. They, they don't listen to the authority figures because there's so many of them compared to the numbers of their parents and their, and their grandparents that they demand change at a level that you don't see at other times in history. And that's what's going on in the Middle East is you have this generation. Now, sadly, the, the Iraq War, the, um, the, the, the Syrian War has churned that up so badly that you're not seeing the results of that generation pushing through. The war in Libya is the same case. Um, and there's been a, a, a backlash to that generation in the sense of the civil war in, in Libya, ISIS is, is a counter to that. I mean, if they're a counter, if ISIS creation is anything in my mind, it's a, it's a reaction to, we've got a generation that's gonna demand change and we don't want that change. We wanna go back to the, the sixth century and that's where this battle is going on. I mean, we're pointed to as the bad guy in the Middle East, but the true bad guy is that time and, and technology is beginning to affect the society in the Middle East, and, and certain people do not want to take that on. Um, and they don't want to retire like the Amish did to seclusion. They want to stay in control in the Middle East. So I know you've worked in Zimbabwe, so let's go down there, because that was always a... Uh, yeah. Uh, a fascinating place for you to be. Tell us some of your experiences there with trying to get rid of yes, Mugabe. Bob. Yes, Bob. Um, well, I, again, this was, I made that transition. I, and it's actually with Zimbabwe I made that transition. I, I worked for IRI in, in Zimbabwe in early, sorry, late 2007, beginning of 2008, which we were coming up to that election. And I don't know, if, just to remind you, um, the presidential candidates were going to be Robert Mugabe, 
for the Zanu PF, the old um, uh, Zam, let's see, Zimbabwean African National Union Party, and uh, Morgan Changarai, who was the, the leader of uh, the MDC. And uh, we were working for Morgan. <laughs> and we, we, were, we were trying very hard. In the beginning of the campaign, I could go in and out of Zimbabwe without much, much problem. But during that, it, things started getting troublesome. They started following me everywhere I went and being bothered. And I'm used to that in some respects. But I also, one of the things I pride myself in is knowing when the winds change and it's time to get, get out of Dodge. And so I got out. Uh, another guy, an NDI guy, stayed on when I said, I think you should get out. He ended up spending a couple of weeks in jail in, in Zimbabwe, So, which I don't know if you can imagine what a Zimbabwe jail is. They're not very nice. So I ended up then getting hired to work on the campaign. And we were doing this from outside Zimbabwe, which was really difficult. But we were beginning to get some traction for Morgan and the campaign. And um, so much so that we, we were all of a sudden raided by thieves, and all our computers were taken. There was money there. There was other things taken. But all our computers went. And uh, it, it, we had to heighten our security at that point in time. But we were able to kind of put real pressure on Mugabe in many ways that the rest of the world was beginning to address what was going on. It, it, it made, as we always say, got above the fold in the papers. And we were, we were beginning to get attention. And one of the biggest ways and I'm actually, was one of the kind of, and I'm probably going to get myself in trouble, but Bob has passed recently. So I was on his list, by the way. I, I couldn't go back to Zimbabwe. I was told by many people, just don't bother going back to Zimbabwe. We, you're not welcome. Um, we, we figured out that one of the things that was going on, again, to kind of give you context, at the time, Zimbabwe was running 1,500% inflation. So if you go into Zimbabwe, and I take... I'd have to do this every day. I'd take $100 and I'd exchange it for Zim dollars. I'd get a beer flat, stacks of money. And everywhere I'd go, I'd have to carry it with me. And if I'd get, take a taxi, I'd have to count out you know, the stack of money. And it took me probably longer to count out the money than the taxi ride took. But um, we figured out what was going on was Bob was controlling the money changers. And he would get all the uh, diaspora money that was coming in to help the families because there was nothing, there was no production going on in Zimbabwe. And he was, he was using that, taking that money in and giving these, these Zim dollars out, which were worthless. And he, the Bank of Zimbabwe was printing money 24 hours a day, just constantly. And we found out the company that was actually selling the paper to Zimbabwe, the Bank of Zimbabwe, was a German company. And as you do in politics, you, you know, go look to smack your opponent. And so we wrote this article saying, you know, the worst kept secret in Zimbabwe is the reason that, that Zimbabwe has this massive uh, inflation is that this German company keeps feeding them paper. And of course, the, in, uh, the other, my other lesson in politics is you never knock someone down with your first punch. It just doesn't work that way. You got to be ready for them to come back at you and then you go back at them and I held back a bit of the information that I had and when we, we wrote the story and this, this went out and the last thing we did is we put the customer service email address of this company in Germany on the bottom and we were, it was reported back to us that within 48 hours that had all collapsed, their whole internet service within this company collapsed because the amount of emails that were press through of people complaining about this. Um, we, we found out we had two things in, in, in reserve. One was that we knew that Angela Merkel, the chancellor, had approached the Bank of Zimbabwe to get their company in there to sell the paper. So when they came back, they said, this was a business decision. This had nothing to do with politics. We had a picture of Angela Merkel meeting with the, with the Bank of Zimbabwe president and said, that doesn't look uh, business to us. That looks like politics. And the second thing was we knew that this company also sold to uh, Transport for London the Oyster card, the card that you use to get into the underground and use on buses. And at that time, one of the guys who was working for us was very close to Boris Johnson, the mayor of London. So we sent a note to Boris. He said, you know that 
you're helping the company that's actually promoting inflation at 1,500% in, in Zimbabwe. So Boris came out and made a statement that he was shocked and appalled to find this out. And so that's when that company said, no mas, we don't want any more, we're going to stop selling paper. Well, the, the impact of that was Bank of Zimbabwe couldn't pub, uh, print money anymore, so at that point in time, they actually opened up the economy and allowed the dollar to be used as the, as the currency of the country. And the, what happened at that was, is now, these, when you went into shops prior, there was nothing on the shelves. It was a complete disaster, hyperinflation situation. Things began to come back into the economy. Things were on the shelves. You could buy something. A company could buy something and know it would be still a value two days from then instead of knowing with 1,500% inflation, if you bought it here two days from now, it's not going to be worth anything. So it opened up the economy. Sadly, when these things began to happen, Bob began to, as we say, release the crack and and let the military loose on on our uh, on our party, and you know, sadly, we lost several several of our members to this. And it's kind of the sad part of this job is that you know there there are, there's a price to pay in doing it. Um, I'm going to talk to you. Let's move on. So tell me, what is the most interesting, fascinating? Tell us some experience. Maybe getting hit by the taxi. Oh, well, let's... What country was that? Senegal. Oh. I, I pissed off the president of Senegal, and I shouldn't have done it. I started a um, Occupy Senegal uh, campaign. He, the, the situation was he was running for re-election, and the constitution <coughs> that he brought in said the president could only be president for two terms. But he was arguing that because he was the president... When, when the Constitution was brought in, it didn't apply to him for his first term. So he was going to go for a third term. So as an attempt to stop the third term, he started an Occupy Senegal campaign. And um, I, again, I was clearly uh, conspicuous being in Senegal walking around. I mean, there's not a lot of white guys from Ohio walking around in, uh, in Senegal. And I used to kind of do this little walk just to give myself some exercise before I headed to the office. And I would always cross right by the presidential palace because there was a crosswalk there. And one day I was crossing, middle of the crosswalk, and I checked both ways. All of a sudden a car came out of nowhere and ran me over, threw me up in the air and knocked me down. And I thought immediately it was an accident. But then a couple things happened. The police were there immediately. The guy was taken away. The car was taken away. Um, and I was left. That was it. No ambulance, no one called. Luckily, some passerby came over and asked me if I was okay, and I said, I think I need an ambulance, which luckily she called and, and got me an ambulance. But it was just one of these things. It was kind of like, cut, you know, next, let's move on. It was, it was a, a very strange incident, but um, it, it just it reminds me always that I have to be careful because I am upsetting people. Change, change hurts to many people. And especially when they have uh, so much in, in, in involved in it and so much at stake, they go to great lengths to try to stop you sometimes. But here's the advantage of this. If you ever invite Lee over as a house guest, he doesn't need a bed. He sleeps on the floor because of his bad back. So uh, uh, m many times in Washington, uh, people come in and there's just this lump on the m in the middle of my living room. And it would be, oh, Lee's visiting. Um, so let's take some questions if we have some, and then I want to ask Lee a couple more questions. Yes, sir. And your name is? John. Hi, John. Welcome. Thank you. Lee, I, I'm very proud of what you and Nancy have done overseas, but do, do not you see a need for what you do here in our country with a broken political, political system that we have? Why expend your efforts overseas? Um, I, I have kind of two answers for that. Um, first of all, I do better outside the U.S. because it's not personal to me. And I, 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 can, I can block the noise. Uh, I'll give an example. I've, I've worked in several countries where I don't speak the language. And I can see things better sometimes without the noise of people telling me how it is. Uh, an example... I, I do speak Russian, but Bulgarian is, is similar, but it's not the same language. 
and uh, we were we were working at we're coming up to a parliamentary election, and we were doing polling regularly, and there was a, a, a hard right party that hadn't been elected before in Russia, uh, sorry, in Bulgaria, that was beginning to get traction, and the question was, were they going to make over that five percent rule? All the people that I worked with in Sofia say, no, they won't. Bulgaria is different. We we don't have the problem that Serbia has or or Romania has of these ultra-fascist parties. But I was, because I couldn't understand the language and conversations people were having, I had to watch for signs of things that were different. And I immediately noticed things that were going on. And uh, the, the push the story forward, we went and did a presentation to the US ambassador. And uh, the pollster who was there was an American. He would come in monthly, and we would you know, do these presentations and said, he, his comment was, well, at the moment, they don't look like they're going to make the 5%. And I, and he, luckily, he said to me, and we had a good relationship, he, he turned to me and he said, but Lee has a different take on it. I said, I think they're going to make the 5% quite easily. I said, there's a, an anger that's bubbling, and I'm seeing it. I'm not hearing it. I'm seeing it, and it will, it will come through. And the ambassador later walked over to me and said, thanks for telling me that. Now i got to go tell Washington that everything I've been telling him is wrong and that we expect these guys to break the 5%. I saw the ambassador after the election. He said, thank you for telling me they got 8%. I see things better, I think, without the, the noise and the, you know, the investment of being an American. Um, American politics, yeah, it's, it's got its problems, but I believe in the system. I think it's going to be fine. I think we're going to knock each other's heads around and you know, I believe in the 40-year rule in American politics, that every 40 years we get this outsider who turns our politics over, and the politics after that individual is so much different than the politics before that individual. Go back to Reagan, go back to Roosevelt, go back to Teddy, go back to Lincoln, go back to Andrew Jackson. And if you want an office individual as president, just think Andrew Jackson. He was the most hated man because he was born on the other side of the Appalachians. You know, we've had it before. It's not, I don't see it as bad as, as I think most people do. But yes, I do. <laughs> yes. This is one of the things, Nancy and I, you know, we're, 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 we're great friends. And in terms of political people I know, Nancy and I agree probably on 90% of things. But this one we've had this long, long back and forth on, that I don't think it's as bad, that I don't think this is anything not seen in this country before. My greatest worry is is impeachment would really damage this country. I mean, I'm sitting in, 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 in the Dole Institute. If any, any institute has a background on the impact of a potential impeachment on the country, it would be this place because Bob Dole suffered the, res the reaction to that in 1976. So I'm not as pessimistic on American politics, I That's guess. why we keep Lee around, because Lee has this historical context, because he's a doctor. Oh, by the way, he speaks seven languages, although he admits to only a few, but um, I drag him onto trips, like to Poland, because he's my universal translator. I, on the other hand, would never think that what I created for a presentation in Moldova, the most corrupt and poorest country of the former Soviets, it's the size of West Virginia, I created a presentation there in 2014 where I started thinking about trust, transparency, and tithing. And now I have to teach this in America. That we have lost, I see that we have lost these items. And I n truly never thought something I'm creating for another country, I now teach here on a regular basis on reminding Americans what we do have here and don't lose that. So, we, we do disagree sometimes. We do, we do. That's, that's kind of the, the, the greatness of our friendship. <laughs> but uh, equally, I'm having the same problem. I've worked in Britain for forever, and I'm watching what's going on in Britain. And one of my problems with, and I remember I had this argument with my, one of my uh, early professors. He, we talked about the, the impact of British unwritten constitution. And I always said, well, there's no, there's no rule or law that says you can't do that. It's just the, the history and the, and, um, and the method of, of, of doing things that are tradition, that that's what keeps people from the runaway speaker or 
the, the government that, that rejects its society, you know, what the, the, the people want. Well, we're witnessing it right now. I mean, that to me is more damaging than what's going on in, in the U.S., but I still, I believe in the system, and I believe the electorate is, is going to get it sorted. I go to a lot of countries. I've worked with elect electorates in 50 countries. They are the smartest things I've ever come across. And I get so annoyed when people say, oh, the voters are stupid. No, they're not. They know what they want and they know what they need. And even more importantly than that, they have the temerity not to say we're, we're right and we're going to stay right. They say, no, we got it wrong and we're going to fix it. And they will punish you if you don't get it right. Or they, they decide, no, we're no longer with you. We're going with the other guy. And I've, I've been the recipient of that several times on campaigns where I've been working on campaigns where these guys are past their sell-by date. So I'm a great believer in the system. I, 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 I truly do. I truly do. I, 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 I worry when people want to change the system just because they don't like the results. I, I mean, a classic example, getting rid of the Electoral College. It drives me insane. I, I, I think everyone should read the Federalist Number 10. I mean, there's, there's two Federalist papers that address this, but Federalist Number 10 is by Madison. And Madison talks about how he, his greatest fear is the mob and that he needs to put a government in, in, in place that can deflect the mob. So the House of Representatives is where the, the, the mass public outpouring will be felt every two years. That's why every two years you're elected. So when there's these vagaries of public opinion, they'll be reflected in the House of, of Representatives. But to stop the mob from electing a president, we're going to let the s smaller states and the bigger states have a, uh, not an equal say, but a relatively equal say, so that public opinion will not be so, so upturning of the system. The, one of the, I, I, you know, people ask me this around the world, how is it that you have the government that you do in the United States? And I said, God granted us four of the most brilliant men ever to walk the earth at a certain time in our history, and they built the structure. And to mess with it, I think, is foolish. It's a fool's errand. You're not smarter than they are. None of us are. So that's my opinion on that. But so I have great faith in the system. And voters, too. Mm, okay. <laughs> so, other questions? Sorry, long, long, short question, long no, answer. No, other questions? Hi, hi, Lee. I was wondering... And what is your name? Oh, Noah. Hi, Noah. Out of all the tasks that I think you've been given and all the different stories which are really fascinating, especially the taxing one, it's, it's insane. What was the, the most crucial and, uh, I would say, hardest task that that you've had to endure and that made the most impact abroad? Well, I, I think the hardest task is, is figuring places out. I mean, that's, we, we're, we're, we're tasked with showing up in a country and within 36, 24, 36, 48 hours, understanding where that country is. So we've got to make judgments really quickly on what's happening in a country. And quite often, these are times of uh, elections, and of course, in a democracy, the weakest time in a democracy is the election time. It's the, it's the chance for people to, to, uh, to meddle in it. It's, it's the chance for you know, a government not to accept. So I've got to make judgments really quickly on the ground. And, and you know, it's, sometimes I go against what those who I'm working with. I'm, you know, I've, I've, I have a temperament that I don't suffer foolishness. And when I go in with a, a group and a party and a, and a leadership or whatever, I'm working with presidents, prime ministers, whatever, and I tell them, you're wrong. This is not how it works. And I'm the foreigner. I'm the, the guy from wherever, and I don't understand their politics. And more times than not, I'm right. And, you know, that, that's not always easy because I've had some you know, really difficult people to work with in those situations. But, you know, that's the tough thing for me is to get in there, figure it out as fast as I can, and make judgments. I think you've always had a really good sixth sense, right? You walk yeah. in, and I used to be parachuted in yeah. to campaigns, 
in America as well as it, in just learning to quickly read the situation as you would say, mm -hmm. we may not, goodness knows I can barely speak English as I like to point out, unlike my universal translator friend, but um, just observing what's happening around you. And a lot of people don't have that, right? No. They, they just, um, they really can't see the forest for the trees. Right, yeah, and having a good instinct is, mm -hmm. is, is definitely required in this job. An example, and again, I'm long answer to a short question. Um, I, I, I was parachuting into Serbia, and there was, in 60 days' time, there was going to be a presidential election. And the first night I was there, I had no experience in, in Serb Serbia. There were two candidates for president, and there was the prime minister who was not up for election, and his public opinion rating was 2%. So he was very unpopular in the country. And this was the staff, the IRI staff I was talking with. We were out for drinks my first night because the guy I was replacing was leaving and he wanted to have the whole staff out and he thought it was a good chance for me to meet them. And They were talking about who the prime minister would come out and endorse. And they knew the one guy he really liked and the other guy he hated, though he had worked with them through the whole transition of Serbian democracy. And and so they were convinced he was going to come out and support this one character. I said, no, he's not going to do that. I said, he's going to come out and say, it doesn't matter who the Serbian people choose. They will be wise, and I will work, I can work with either of them. And they laughed. They were in hysterics. The next day, the headlines in the paper was an interview by the prime minister saying exactly that. And they were furious. They said, you knew that when you told us that. You had read the newspaper. I said, I don't read Serbian. But it's clear politics. He knew that if he would endorse one of the candidates, that would be the kiss of death. And that's the kind of instinct you need. You just know that that's not going to happen. And if, if someone wants to work in that field, I highly, highly recommend is to, to work on that, to look at things and understand why is it that um, these things happen. And secondly to your thing is also, we run campaigns in the West a certain way. Well, what happens if you don't have polling? What happens if you don't have... Um, TV ads to run? What happens if you don't, you've got to learn and figure out how to do all the same things that we do, targeting, um, getting out the vote, um, getting your message out, building a message, all those things without the resources that we normally take for granted here. Other questions? I'm curious, if you look at all the campaigns you've worked on, uh, would you have been as successful if your position was held by a woman in all of the foreign lands that you've been in? Um, I think it would, in some cases it would have been more difficult. As I've worked for several women campaigns. I've, I've worked with uh, McDella Cooper, who ran for president of Liberia. I've worked with uh, the group with Joyce Banda, uh, who ran for president in Malawi. And... Knowing their difficulties, I would think being the person who stands there and tells them what to do would have a very difficult time. And to clarify, if, if your position was that of, if you were a woman mm -hmm. having authoritarian consult to mm -hmm. someone, would that have made it more difficult? I would think so. I mean, it, you have this respect problem that you know, sometimes you, you give them what seems to them contrarian um, advice. You've got to fight your corner. And it is a, it is a real battle. And in some very male-dominated societies, that's quite difficult to do. I mean, we really haven't talked much about the role of women in the politics that I've worked, other than the Russia stuff. But I, I'm, you know, certain things always worry me, like, so often women's auxiliaries or women's programs within political parties are quite often used as, as blocking mechanisms to let women come through the process because their, their, their purpose in the West is to teach leadership, to bring them into the main party so they can be represented. And I'm always skeptical of, of how we work with them and how we can kind of transform them into not just being let's keep the ladies over here in, in the powder room and we can run our politics over here like, like the hard men we are. And, and, and that's always kind of one of the yeah. challenges we face. Um, the other one that I always worry about too is, is when they want quotas for women in parliament or something like that. 
And the reason I fear that is because, okay, we, we, we accept a, you know, a one-third rule. Well, then what happens? Do we get to the, we want more than, you know, a third of the women being representatives. Are you, they're going to use that as a block. Well, you've got yours, and, and forever you will have that. I'm sorry, I don't want that. I no, we've talked about that, especially, I mean, it, obviously it has worked in Rwanda, where yeah. there's now 67 women out mm. of the 100 in their parliament. But in most other places I've worked, especially Middle East and in, in Latin America, they'll prop up, here's a dozen women. Yeah. Or in Mexico, uh, we have discussed, they had a 50% quota for women. Well, you didn't have 50% of the leaders in the pipeline who were ready to run for office. And it was almost like, let's just go find some women that are in the market and have them come to this training. And then we often find that uh, after they are elected, they resign so their husband can mm -hmm. be there um, and take the place because it only has to be on the ballot. Um, I've certainly dealt with that. And then also um, the political parties pulling all the, right? They're just marionettes. Yeah. And they're there as the woman, but they have absolutely no voice. And so that's why I think that a quota sounds good as yeah. we especially look at uh, American women rank, you know, anywhere from you know, 78th out of all the countries for the number of women in elected offices, but we're never going to have a quota here. And, and yeah. um, so I think that, it, but there's a lot of people that go, oh my gosh, uh, there are more women in parliament in, you know, in, in Venezuela. I'm going, you know, it's Venezuela, right? I mean, it, it, it's not making any difference. Yeah, what, what authority do they have within it? And of course, the other problem, and this is an old axiom, and um, you and I have argued about this a bit, is that it's an old axiom in politics. Women don't vote for women. And you see that a lot in the countries I've worked in. Mm -hmm. um, Russia, we were, we were talking with uh, Vitaly, who ran um, Subchuka's yes. campaign. And he, he, she was the one that ran against Putin. Her father was a very famed uh, governor of St. Petersburg. And uh, she was running for president against Putin as a voice of democracy. And, and he went through great frustration. He was hoping he could get at least some traction. He wasn't expecting to beat Putin, but to have a voice that pushed through on the dem Democratic side to, you know, even a third of the vote would have been, you know, headline news around the globe. And he said, we couldn't get women to support us, which we thought would be a natural progression. And it's, it's a problem. I mean, you yeah, know. It starts when we're 12 and 13, and unfortunately it never ends. Yeah, it has been, I call it teenagers, the great teenage wasteland. Because that's when girls become competitive yeah. and uh, against each other for male attention. Yeah. And in some places, and in many countries we work in, they never grow out of that. No. And they are very resentful of a woman who has power, money, success, success yeah. that I am not having. Right. So to the women here who are going to be running for office, remember, be nice to the guys. They're the ones that vote for you. It's They're the ones that come out. It, I, it is. It's with, been, when I worked with, with um, Margaret Thatcher in, in the early days, and we always knew that because we had to make up for a gap in the female vote, we, we had to get certain um, kind of quarters of men within that, that, you know, especially the, it was that level of, they're called C3s, but they're working class, middle class, lower middle class, that, that kind of break, that if you can get, we could, we always felt if you get that, those men to vote, we could, you know, cut the, the, the disadvantage with the women's vote. And, and in a way, the 2016 vote was kind of mm -hmm. like that for, for Hillary Clinton. She lost that, yeah, that, that's, that, that swath of women's votes well, that she needed to care for. 53% of white women voted yeah. for um, Trump. Yeah. And now that could not counteract the 90-some percent that of black women and right. the high number of right. uh, Latino and Hispanic right. women. And she lost the, the blue-collar white males yes. as well. And you Couldn't can't... Make up you can't overcome that. So, you, you know, looking at it from 10,000 feet and not Hillary Trump, you've got you've to understand that those are, those are areas that you need to, to work out in your campaign, that we need to get those votes or we're not going to win this. So real question from this side. One more question. Anyone else? Oh, please. And your name? Taylor. That's right. So you spoke a little bit about um, working on a secular campaign mm -hmm. when you were in the Middle East. Um, how often did 
the country's religion come into the politics and the problems that you had to deal with, with campaigning or changing things? Right. Um, it, I mean, the, the, the clearest case of that, obviously, is the Middle East and what the Middle East is going through right now. And just a note, of the nine secular parties' headquarters, eight of them were blown up. I, I was the only one that wasn't, you know. Um, religion is a huge problem, obviously, in the Middle East and, and what they're going through. And uh, I, I'm, I always love the book by um, Bernard Russell about what went wrong, and it talks about that religious problem. But the relig religious problem in Russia was, was a, a big factor, too. And again, not exactly the role of the uh, Orthodox Church, but how society, you know, how we see God, I know this is a very philosophical thing, but how we see God is how we see our leaders, is a, you know, well-accepted premise in philosophy. And in Orthodox religion, God makes the rules, but God doesn't apply the rules to himself. He hands them down and distributes it. Well, that's the same way the leaders react. Well, in Russia, you have the leader, and he passes down a rule. Well, everyone adheres to the the leader's rule until he turns his head and then it's like, well, he's not looking, so I'll just pass it down. And that whole structure of how a society works and interacts makes it really difficult to get change through and get political organization to work. And I mean, just think about your organizational structure. How do you get a party to work when the, the leader of the party sees himself as a great leader and, you know, passes down dictates and then turns his back and everyone's like, yeah, we're not doing that. We're going to make the guys below us do that. So culturally, religion is a huge part. And I, you know, what every country I've worked in, it has a role to play. It's not as um, kind of in your face as what we're, we're facing in the Middle East, but it is an issue. And we'll end on something joyful. So tell me, who have you had the best adventures with ever in England, in mm. Great Britain. Oh, well, I'm, 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 I know what you're pushing towards. I have a story to tell. <laughs> Nancy's a rabbit whisperer. I don't know if any of you know this. I'm N a critter whisperer in general. Yeah, critter rabbits whisperer in general. Every rabbits day is Easter at my house. Right, and there's this, this, this place in, in, um, in Britain called Rabbit World, and it's way out in the, the West Country. <laughs> and Nancy's in London for just a few days, and I'm I'm, I'm there, and I'm like, Nance, do you want to go and have a tour of the House of Commons and, and House of Lords, and we can get you through? No, I want to go to Rabbit World. It's like, where's Rabbit World? So she shows I me have this, the brochure. this brochure, and I mean, it, and it's got to be 20 years old, because it's old, it's, it's dog-eared and everything. So we find out where it is, we drive out there, and they have this huge barn. I'm going to tell a quick story, because I want to end it. There's many stories of this. This huge <laughs> barn with all these hundreds of rabbits. And I'm walking around, and Nancy's taking her time, and all of a sudden, Nancy walks into this barn and goes, hello, fellas, every rabbit. <laughs> this is hundreds of rabbits. Hundreds of rabbits. <laughs> every rabbit in that barn perks its ears up and turns to, where's Nancy? Because she'll have treats. <laughs> yes, she'll have something. So this is, this is my experience with Nancy. I mean, we do a lot in politics, but yeah, we have to go to rabbit world too. It was quite amazing. And yeah. they also had all these sheep, and Ebenezer the goat was yeah. like the mascot. Yeah. And so I go in to feed Ebenezer, and he knocks me over and takes all the food. I'm, and yeah. we have a former grad student of mine who went away, who came with us on this many-hour-long adventure. And I said, okay, Dina, you have to go get more food because I'm out of food. And she could not believe because I'm on the ground petting goats and sheep, and she's off getting more food. I think we could have, in, if that would happen today with, with Ebenezer, you could have him for uh, sexual harassment, because he oh, just, yeah, he he just was, knocked you over and no, took he, your he did. food. Yeah. He stole my food. So, yeah. uh, and let's just say there was one other trip in the snow, <laughs> where, again, he said, what would you like to do? And I said, let's I, rent a car. I haven't learned my lesson yet, uh, say to Nancy. She give me options, and I said, I want to go to Beatrice Potter's world, because there's Peter Rabbit world there which no adult goes to. Let's just be clear here. Yeah. The, but, the chairs are literally <laughs> this high. And uh, so it was actually an overnight trip. You're getting ready to go to Russia, yeah. and I make you drive a two-day drive to Beatrice Potter World, and it was snowing, and it doesn't really snow there. But, but we went to Peter Rabbit World, yes. and there was this great presentation about 
this history of Peter Rabbit, and I'm crying because it's so emotional because it's Beatrice Potter, and, and all of a sudden it says, and who's the greatest bunny in the world? And this, like, 20-foot Peter Rabbit comes up from the, on the stage, and I'm crying, and, and of course, what I'm does outraged. my friend say? I'm but, outraged. Bugs Bunny is the most famous <laughs> rabbit in the world, is he not? See? Yeah, so, but there are photos of these experiences yes, yes. With, uh, uh, with this. And but. you asked me why I don't have a, 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 a footprint in a social media. Pictures like that will come this up. Is the, these are the kinds of pictures I put on social media. And with that, thank you so much, Lee. You are such a treasure. I appreciate your being here today. Happy to be here. Thank, thank you. you for everyone coming. And we have a little treat. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Happy birthday, dear Lee. Happy birthday to you. And it's gluten free. Oh, it's a special wonderful. cake just wonderful. for you. Wonderful. Well, please stay around, and we'll have it. We'll get a cut. And so yes, Lee actually came here on his birthday because I invited him. So you might, you know, it's just an amazing relationship. <laughs> So we'll go save the world and eat gluten-free cake. And thank you again. Remember, next week, Deb Sofield will be our guest, my guest, and she'll be great fun because she also has some stories to tell. So thank you again. We'll see you next week.